If you have your Bibles this morning, turn to Daniel chapter 9. We want to highlight just some thoughts in Daniel chapter 9, and then we're going to, we're really sort of heading somewhere towards the tail end of the message. And uh, man, there's just some amazing spiritual applications in this chapter. You know, last week we talked about uh, this chapter and, and uh, man, a whole pile of this chapter is Daniel making confession. And of course, he's confessing the sins of the people of Israel as a, as a nation. And he identifies with them in that confession. And, you know, we talked about that. We talked about, uh, you know, the confession that God wants from a lost person that, you know, nobody gets saved. Nobody gets their sins washed away as far as getting to heaven. Nobody gets that done by thinking, oh, you know, I'll get on my knees and I'll tell God all my sins and I'll ask him to forgive me. Well, you know what? That's a good thing. And God offers that forgiveness, but he doesn't offer it because a sinner, you know, makes a big, long confession. Because the fact of the matter is, uh, if a sinner has to make a long confession, there's a thousand and one things. He's a million and one things. He's not going to remember, depending on how long he's been alive. And uh, the confession that the Lord wants from a lost man is, yes, he's got to recognize his sinfulness. And that's, that's almost a no-brainer, although you cannot be saved until that recognition is made. The confession that the Lord wants from a lost man is that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made. He's looking for a confession that you believe that Jesus is all he claimed to be, and you want what he offers for you. And that's the confession that the Lord is looking for from a lost man. Um, but from the people of God, from the people of God, you know, our, our fellowship hinges, you know, on, you know, keeping those those uh, accounts short with God, you know, uh, we're saved and, uh, you know, our, our sins as a unit, our sins at the courtroom of God because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, Amen. the charges have been dropped. Uh, we are considered not guilty in the courtroom, but from day to day, you know, our, you know, we still sin, you know, uh, uh, there's not a just man on the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. It's like anybody in this room that is married, you know, uh, you, you're, you're married and you have a wonderful relationship and you're, 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 it's, it's, um, it's lifelong, it's, it's a bond, it's a unit, it's joined. It's, and, um, you know, just because you forgot to pick up your underwear or you burnt the toast, it doesn't mean that that bond is severed. Okay, that bond is intended to be perpetual. Just our salvation is eternal. And marriage is a picture of that. Uh, I, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Uh, for this reason shall a man leave his father and mother and be cleaved unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. You know, in marriage, it's the picture. The Bible says in Romans 7, at salvation, we are Mary to another, even to him that raised up from the dead. Uh, marriage is the picture of salvation. And um, you know what? You burnt the toast. You know, you forgot to do this or that or the other. You know, or, or maybe, maybe you just got ornery and you really did some things on purpose. Um, does, that, does, that change, does that change the union? It does not. But some confession would help. An honest apology would restore the fellowship. And so you see the likeness in our walk with God. Um, so there's a couple interesting things that turn up in the midst of his confession. Look at uh, Daniel 9 and look at verse 8. He makes a statement. Daniel 9, verse 8. Boy, the Bible is so politically incorrect. It's just unbelievable. And when you when you learn to accept that, it's actually just wonderful. It's just wonderful. But be that as it may, look at Daniel 9, verse 8. O Lord, Daniel says, to us belongeth 
confusion of face to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers because we have sinned against thee. To the Lord, our God, belong mercies and forgivenesses, though we have rebelled against him. You'll notice in verse 8, he says, he says, Lord, to us belongeth. He's saying, Lord, this is what we are. You ready? This is our birthright. This is what you are entitled to. Oh, what a mess is our society. The most entitled bunch of weaklings that have ever lived. Selfish, spoiled, and they just think everything should be handed to them. And when Daniel gets close to God, Daniel says, Lord, I want you to know that I'm thinking like you're thinking, Lord. And he says, Lord, I know what I'm entitled to. I know what is mine. I know what is coming to us. And I know what I'm going to get if I get what's mine. I know what we possess within ourselves. I know where I live, Lord. To us belongeth confusion. Confusion. But boy, verse 9, he switches to a sweet note. And he says, but Lord, I know what belongs to you. To the Lord, verse 9, our God, belong mercies. Notice there's a plural. There's an S on that. Belong mercies and forgivenesses, plural. Mercies and forgivenesses of every type, of every shade, for inward sins, for outward sins, for refined cultured sins, for horrible sins, for sins of every culture and every nation and every race, for religious sins, for jungle sins, for atheist sins, for educated sins. He said, God, he said, if we need forgiveness, he said, Lord, we know, we know that belongs to you. And man, he loves to give it. He loves to give it. Verse 11, he says, yea, all Israel have transgressed. Look at it, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore, the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written, that is written. You know, um, the thought of sin is transgression. To transgress, trans, T-R-A-N-S, and we won't touch that one. T-R-A-N-S, and it, it means movement, it means movement. And the picture is this. Man, I, I saw it again, and, and we've often mentioned this. I was somewhere not long ago and I was in a rural area and I saw a sign on a farmer's fence said no trespassing. Now, if I don't miss my guess, that same farmer probably had those signs at various locations because that's what they'll do, you know, because they don't want hunters in. They don't want they don't want photographers in. They don't want anybody in there because it's their property. And God only knows, you know, I mean, what's what's in that property and and uh and they put up no trespassing. Do you know what? It doesn't matter which fence you cross. If it's his property, you have trespassed. It doesn't matter which fence you cross. You know what God did in, in, in the Ten Commandments? He gave us ten fences. And actually, he gave a whole lot more. But he gave us ten basic fences. It doesn't matter whether you trespass at the first one. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Or you trespass at the second one. Thou shalt not make any images or bow down. Or that you trespass at, uh, you know, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Or whether you dishonor your mother and father. Or whether you, dis you, uh, you commit murder. Or you bear false witness. Or, or you cut. It, it doesn't matter which fence you cross. When you cross it, you have transgressed. And how do you know? Because it is written. It's not about how you feel. It's not about your situation. It's not about your upbringing. It's not about the hard time you had. It's not the church. You, it has nothing to do. God says, God says, I told you where the fences are. And Daniel says, Lord, we have crossed the fences. That's what sin is. It's about what's written. It's not about your feeling. It's not about, well, pastor, I don't, I don't feel convicted about that. It has nothing to do with that. Absolutely 
Nothing. It has to do with what did he write? What is written? That's what makes people, that's what makes us all transgressors. Transgressors. Verse 12. And he hath confirmed his words, and he hath confirmed his words which he spake. And in that verse, Daniel says, you know, the Lord long before had promised that if we if we began to drift from him, you know, he would warn us and he would be patient. But if we would not return, God said, and always remember, everything God said will always come to pass. Always. He said, if you don't return, God says, you're in, you're going into captivity. God says, I'm going to raise up another group, a foreign group, and they will, they will conquer you. Well, Daniel said, Lord, here we are. He said, Lord, here I am sitting in Babylon. And Lord, I'm the children of the captives. And he said, Lord, you certainly have confirmed what you said. But notice what Daniel begins to do. So you, the first part of the chapter is about his confession. But he quickly moves from confession into another phase of this. And, uh, and, and it's really sort of intertwined throughout the chapter. Um, but look at verse, um, look at verse 15. And now, O Lord, our God, thou hast brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and hast gotten thee renowned as at this day. He said, Lord, the nations have never forgot about the Red Sea. He said, we have neither, Lord. But he said, but Lord, and here's the tragedy. He said, Lord, that, that really happened. But he said, but Lord, we sure blew it. Verse 15, we, 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 we have sinned. We have done wickedly. Oh, Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city, Jerusalem, thy holy mountain. Because notice he keeps using these plural pronouns. Because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. Now, therefore, O God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications and cause thy face to shine. You know, he, he keeps on going and, and you know what he's doing. Look at verse 20. And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord, my God for the Holy mountain of my God. There's a big word and it's a Bible word. You know what he's doing in the beginning part of the chapter, he's confessing. And again, the confession is sort of interwoven throughout this whole passage, but he's confessing and he's confessing and he's confession, but he's also pleading. The Bible word is intercession, interceding Isaiah 59. It says the Lord looked down and he wondered that there was no intercessor. The intercessor is the person that steps between. To intercede is to come between. There's two parties, and, and, and there's a problem, and there's, there's, there's a battle going on, and somebody steps in between, and they plead for the one regarding the other. And they're the intercessor. Of course, we always think of that as believers. We, we think of that in prayer, and here you see it. And Daniel uses the word we and us. He uses the word we ten times in this passage, and then he uses the word us eight times. Though Daniel was not guilty, he's interceding. He's saying, Lord, here's where we're at. We deserve to be here. They're saying, but Lord, could I talk to you about this, Lord? Lord, could we could we change the plan a little here, Lord? Lord, would you hear me? And he steps in between and begins to intercede. You know, Moses interceded in Genesis 32. Genesis, you don't have to turn there, but Moses comes down off the mountain. You know, he's been on Mount Sinai and he's gotten the, the, the Ten Commandments the, on the two tables of stone written with the finger of God. And he, but he's been up in that mountain 40 days. And um, what an amazing thing. I mean, the fire of God has been on that mountain for 40 days. Can you imagine backsliding with the fire of God still burning on the mountain in front of you? And yet they did. After 40 days, 
That's about six weeks. It had been a while. And they thought, wow, they thought, I wonder if Moses got killed up there. I wonder what happened to him. And so they decide, we're going to build our, we're going to build a calf and we're going to worship it. And of course, as soon as they did that, I mean, they're doing it in the face of God Almighty. God is there on the mount. It's obvious he's there. And you know what? God was furious. God was furious. God looks at Moses and he says, Moses, he says, get thee down. The people which you brought out of Egypt have quickly corrupted themselves. And he says, he says to Moses, let me alone. God says that my anger may wax, wax hot. And he said, I will consume them. And he said, I'll start all over with you, Moses. That would have been a flattering offer if you didn't care. But Moses cared. And he said, but Lord. He said, Lord, could we think about this a minute? And in the next two or three verses in Genesis 32, God stops what he is about to do because one man intercedes. You see it again in, um, again, you don't need to turn there, but Genesis 18, the angels come to Abraham's door and they say, Abraham, you know, we're, we're on our way to Sodom. We're just going to check it out. We've heard some things and, um, and God doesn't tell us all the conversation that took place. But in that chapter towards the end, God says, as if he's talking to himself, he says, shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? And there must have been an ensuing conversation. Abraham had his nephew Lot and Lot's family in Sodom. And a few verses down, Abraham begins to plead before the Lord in that famous passage where he says, Lord, would you, Lord, what if there's, what if there's 50 righteous people? Would you, would you destroy it? Surely, Lord, surely, Lord, you wouldn't do that. You got to read an amazing passage. He says, Lord, surely you wouldn't do that. And the Lord said, if I can find 50, I won't destroy it. And then he says, well, Lord, what if there's just 40? He says, Lord, you wouldn't, you wouldn't destroy it just because there was 10 Ten less, would you? And God, keep, uh, Abraham keeps going down, and finally he brings it down to ten people. And you know, probably what Abraham was thinking, he's thinking Lot, his wife, his three sons, their wives, and some kids. He's thinking, I'm safe now. He said, Lord, you wouldn't destroy it for ten, would you? And the Lord said, if I find ten... <clears throat> I will not destroy it. You know what you got going on there? You got a man and he has stepped in between. Look at verse 16. Oh Lord, according to all thy righteousness, now watch, I beseech thee. Look at verse 17. Now, therefore, O oh our God, hear the prayer of thy servant. In verse 20, in verse 21, verse 22, verse 23, all of a sudden you see all these personal pronouns. All of a sudden Daniel switches from we and it's I and I and me and me and me. And you know, one of the things you see from that, the great encouragement is that God hears the prayers of one person. You know, I think a lot of God's people, there's something, maybe it's personal, maybe it's in your family, you know, uh, maybe it's bigger than your family. And the temptation is to think, wow, you know, if I could get a whole bunch of people praying about this, something might happen. And then instantly you have the realization that, you know, I'm probably not going to, I'm probably not going to make that happen. But you see one man pleading for a nation, one man. Ezekiel 22, and I sought for a man that should stand in the gap before me that I should not destroy the land. Um, it's amazing what God will do for one person. You say, man, I, you know, it, it, you might be blessed. You might have some Christian friends that, man, they'll jump right in with you. And, man, we ought to do that for each other. But, you know, there's some things and there's some burdens. Maybe they're too personal to talk about. Or there's some things that nobody will care 
like you. And in this chapter, you see once again that God, God moves massively for the prayer of one man who is very serious, who is very serious. Look at verse 20. And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people and presenting my supplication before the Lord, my God, for the holy mountain of my God. I want you to notice the second word. And whilst I was speaking, verse 20, 21, yea, whilst I was speaking prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom he had seen at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly. You know, um, an honest conversation with God, an honest conversation brought an immediate answer. Now, I want to say this. Remember, first of all, what preceded it. First of all, confession preceded it. There was some real heart-to-heart honesty with God, deep honesty. And then second, he turned his prayer to pray for the people that he loved. He turned his prayer to pray for the people that he loved. And it is interesting that God immediately sent an answer on the way. It says in verse 21 that Gabriel was caused to fly swiftly. He was caused to fly swiftly. This happened about the time of the evening oblation. There was a morning and an evening sacrifice that would have been offered, but of course the temple was desolate. But Daniel continued to try to keep those regular appointments with God. And um, it was a set time to meet God in the temple. It was a set time to make an offering. And Daniel carried that through. And uh, boy, sure God sure honors that thing of you regularly meeting with God. You never know. One of these days, you're, you're going to get on your knees, and it'll be your set time. Do you have a set time to meet with God? You know, God intends that. You see that that principle sort of runs from one end of the Bible to the other. You can talk to God any time, day or night. You can meditate. You can read. You can memorize. You can do anything. But, but boy, there's something to be said for a regular meeting with God. And it was about the time of the evening oblation. He gets on his knees, and he opens his windows toward Jerusalem, the city that was desolate, where the temple no longer stood, and he calls out to God. But this time, an angel met him. An angel met him. And why? Well, we know two things. There was serious confession, and he was pleading for his friends. And God said, I'm going to answer this. I'm going to move now. One of the things that you see in this passage is he gave Daniel more than he asked for. He sent Gabriel. Daniel didn't ask for that. He gave Daniel a personal word. Daniel wasn't praying for that. Look at his prayer request. Again, it's verse 16 and 17. This is his request. O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee. Let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city Jerusalem, thy holy mountain. Because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. Now, therefore, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. O my God, incline thine ear and hear, open thine eyes and behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name. He's talking about the sanctuary. That's the church house. You know, uh, God said to Moses, let them make me a sanctuary. And there I will meet with thee. It was a place where they would meet with the Lord. It was a place of worship. It was a place of trumpets and singers. It was a place of assurance. It was the center of their world. It was what made them who they were. It was the place of the worship of the true God and of his book. And God was their father. A lot of similarities. 
You know what they used to call the auditoriums and churches? They used to call it the sanctuary. And, you know, we, we know there's nothing holy about a building, uh, especially. But there is something to be said for the place that we meet with God. And Daniel was burdened and his prayer was for the sanctuary. He was deeply concerned about the sanctuary. Boy, it would be wonderful if more God's people were deeply concerned about the sanctuary. He was. And he was deeply concerned about his city. That city. To them, that was that was a, it represented home. It represented peace. It represented prosperity. It represented the way it used to be. It was the place of the homecoming. You know, when I was a kid growing up, we attended some country churches. And uh, one of the things they did in those country churches, it was a big tradition. Every summer, you'd have a homecoming, homecoming Sunday. And uh, I mean, some of those churches were way out in the country. And, and all of a sudden, the, everybody and their brother and people that used to attend and people that had moved away. And, and uh, it was like a uh, terrible example. It was like Mecca. And uh, uh, everybody would come back for that Sunday. And man, they'd have dinner on the grounds and they'd have, just like you guys, you guys bring wonderful food. They'd have food and they'd have kids playing out in the churchyard and, and it was usually hot and miserable. And, and you see people sweat and people's with fans and man, they have the morning service in the building and the afternoon service would be outside and they'd bring in a guest and it was a wonderful day. It was reunion. It was homecoming. You know what Jerusalem was for the Jews? It was homecoming. And especially at the Passover. We talked about it in the book of John. Jesus comes to Jerusalem at the Passover. And the city was always full. There were millions of people that would converge at Passover. It was homecoming. You know what Daniel's prayer was? Daniel was remembering. He said, oh, Lord God, I remember what it used to be. Lord, I remember what my parents told me it was like, Lord. Lord, could you bring that back? And that's, what he's, that's his request. That's his request. He didn't ask for an angel. He didn't ask for a personal word, but God gave him one. Look at verse 23. He's confessed, he's interceding, and now God answers him. And God gives him more than he asked. Verse 23, Gabriel says, At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, Dan, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider he says, Daniel, he said, I just want you to know on heaven's side. He said, we think highly of you. You know, none of us are going to get a heavenly visitor today. But can you imagine, you know, you're having a, you know, you're praying and you're discouraged and you're praying about something that's a burden to your heart. And all of a sudden there's a knock at your door and there's a visitor from heaven. And they said, I got your answer. But while I'm here, I just want to tell you, we think a whole lot of you in heaven. I'd make your day, wouldn't it? Well, he didn't ask for that. He didn't ask for a definite time frame. He just said, Lord, the sanctuary, Lord, the city. And the angel, the angel came back and the answer was, I'm going to do that. And I'm going to tell you when, verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins. And he goes on down, verse 25, know therefore from and to understand from the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem and to Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks. And he goes on down. He gives him a time frame. Daniel didn't ask for that. He gave Daniel a revelation of what was near future. What was near was Jerusalem would be rebuilt. That was going to happen within the next year or two. Uh, that was the near future. But he gave him a revelation about the distant future. Look at verse 27. Look at the. Look at the last half of the verse there. You'll see this phrase, even until the consummation. And that means the end of all things. I mean, all of a sudden, uh, uh, Daniel's getting a revelation about what's close and about what's far away. And, and then the angel gives him insight into God's purpose on several fronts. He didn't ask for that. Look at it. Verse uh, 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city. Watch. 
to finish transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. I mean, he just unloaded a mouthful on Daniel. He gave him insight into God's purpose. He gave him word about the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 25. Mm -hmm. Know therefore and understand from the going forth of the commandment to restore to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince. Mm -hmm. Shall be seven weeks. Look at verse 26. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. But not for himself. He gives him word about the Lord Jesus Christ. Long before anybody knew Jesus' name. You know, they didn't know Jesus' name. Well, they, they knew he would be called Emmanuel. And, of course, Isaiah gave him a bunch of titles. But not until the angel visited the shepherds and, and Mary, his name shall be called Jesus. That name was never given. They knew that uh, they knew their deliverer was coming. They knew that it was prophesied. But Gabriel gives him word about the Lord Jesus Christ, about his first coming, about when it would be, and that he would be cut off, that he would die, and that it would not be for himself. In other words, not for any crime that he would do. You know, Pilate said, I find no fault in him. <clears throat> Caiaphas said, it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people. He says, Daniel, he said, uh, he said, you know, the Messiah is coming and he's the prince. He's going to rule just, just like you've heard, Daniel. This is what, what Daniel asked for. And then as you read on down, he tells him about the street. He tells him about the wall. He tells him about an evil prince. He tells him about a war that's coming. And he tells him about a glorious end. You know, uh, God gave Daniel more than he asked for. And what I want to what I want to finish up with this morning is I want you to consider with me that that is God's way. When God finds people that mean business with him and that they will confess, you know, a lot of God's people, the reason that there's no real heartfelt, really, there's so much of what the, the Bible describes as the experience of a Christian that they read and they know. But it is not their experience. Are they saved? Yes, they are. But there's, there's something desperately wrong, and they just write it off. They say, well, you know, that's not my personality, and, and you know, and, or, and whatever they blame it on. But there's a reason why they don't experience many things, and, and it all starts with they won't acknowledge what's theirs. Lord, to us belongeth confusion. They, they, think, they think they're all that in a bag of chips. They think they're pretty good dudes. They're not near as bad as you know, carnal Sally across the church there. They're not, they're not near as bad as self and self indulgent, you know, Bob over there. That was the only name came to head, sorry. <laughs> no, no, they're not near as bad as him. You know what they don't do? No confession. You know, when Daniel made a serious confession and then he began to plead for his friends, things started happening immediately. Me. God gave Daniel what he asked for, but he gave him more. Would you look real quick with me at 1 Kings chapter 1? This is God's way. God gives more than we ask for. God gives more. First Kings three, verse five in Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon. First Kings three, verse five in Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night and said, ask what I shall give thee. 
you know, every every plot in Hollywood, most of them are just, you know, they, they get it from the Bible. It's just twisted. You know, the guy that grabs the genie bottle and rubs it, the genie pops out and says, I'll give you three wishes. You know where they got that? Right here. God appears to Solomon and says, tell me what you want, Solomon. And Solomon said, thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness, that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as at this day. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or to come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Here it is. Give therefore thy servant. Lord, this is what I want. An understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this thy so great a people? Now watch. And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and understanding heart. He says, okay, I'm going to give you what you asked for. So that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days, and if thou wilt walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as thy father David did walk, then I will lengthen thy days. Solomon says, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to rule this people. Lord, if I can only have one thing, give me a heart that can rule this people. And God says, Solomon, I'll give you that. And I'll give you a whole lot more. Look at Genesis 15. Genesis 15. Look at Genesis 15 in one hand and get Romans chapter 4 in the other, if you would. Get Genesis 15 in one hand and Romans chapter 4 in the other. Of course, you know, in Genesis 12, God had made a promise to Abraham and God says, you know, I'll I'll, um, I'll make of thee a great nation. I will make of thee a great nation. Well, how's that going to happen? Well, you got to have some kids. It's, you know, it's got to start somewhere. Well, you get to Genesis 15 and um, it's not happening. So in Genesis 15, verse one, it says, after these things, the word of the Lord came into Abram in a vision, saying, fear not, Abram. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord, God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? Verse 3, and Abram said, Behold, to me hast thou given no seed. He said, Lord, you said a great nation would come from me. But he said, but Lord, I have no child, and it's getting dimmer by the day. Now, you know the story. You know that God waited till Abraham. Abram was 90 years old, nine, and then he spoke to him. Many more years passed from Genesis 15. And God describes this. And, you know, if, if, if God didn't tell us something, we would just say, well, you know, it was still one of those longevity things. And even though he was 100 years old, God just still, he was still able to have kids. Well, that's not how God describes it. Look at Romans 4. Look at Romans 4, verse 19. God describes this time in Abraham's life. Now, remember, what did Abraham ask in Genesis 15? He said, Lord, 
what wilt thou give me? Seeing I go childless. He said, Lord, I, I really would like to have a child here, Lord. That was his request. Look at Romans 4 and look at verse 19. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. When he was a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Go to Genesis 25. So you guys know the story. An angel pays Abraham a visit and said, this time next year, he said, Sarah's going to have a child. And you guys know the story. Sarah laughed being, you know, being full of faith. She laughed because she didn't think it could happen. And uh, the angel rebukes her. And, and lo and behold, uh, the next year, Isaac is born. And uh, remember his request. He said, Lord, will, will you give me a child? Will you give me one? And, and so what did God do? God granted his request. But look at Genesis 25. This is again a number of years later. So when he had Isaac, it says his body was now dead. Genesis 25. Then again, Abraham took a wife and her name was Keturah. And she bare him Zimran and Jokshan and Medan and Midian, and Ishbak, and Shua. That's pretty good for a dead man. You know what God did? God said, Abraham, if you don't mind, I'll give you more than you asked for. Open your Bible and look. You'll see it all over the place. Hannah says, Lord, I want a child. And the Lord says, I'll give, her, I'll give you your request. And then he gave her five more. In Acts 16, the Philippian jailer says, what must I do to be saved? All he's asking is for himself. And Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou, that's your request, shalt be saved and thy house he said i'll i'll hear your request and i'll give you more there's a reason to ask there's a reason to keep asking there's a reason to have a bright outlook there's a reason to want to be on praying ground i uh, you know i don't know maybe maybe you're a little brain dead this morning but um i i want to ask you i think some of you it wouldn't take long and you, would, uh, you wouldn't have to think hard. Hasn't God given you more than you asked for? You know, a lot of you, you know, you got saved. Remember that day? Remember the day? And you know, when you got saved, you were just like the rest of us. You were under conviction. You understood the reality of hell. You knew you were going there. And I mean, you know, however, whatever it was that struck a chord in your heart, maybe it was the love of God. Maybe it was the offer of a new life, whatever it was. But you knew you were a sinner and you knew he was the Savior. And by a deliberate act of your will, you called on him, trusted him to keep his word. And man, in a moment of time, we sang it. Oh, how quickly the transaction was made. When as a sinner, I think. It was in a moment. And you know what he did? He saved you. He gave you your request. But didn't he give you more? Yes. He gave you peace. He gave you a new song. He gave you joy. He gave you a reason to live. Some of you, he got off the hook as far as the law. He gave you relief from a bitter past. Some of you, he gave you your health back. Some of you, he gave you your brain back. He gave you your marriage back. He gave you normal kids. I had a friend of mine, he said, man, before I was saved, I did tons of dope. And he said, uh, he said, every time we had a baby, he said, I got saved. And me and my wife started having babies. He said, Every time I had a baby, he said, he said, the doc would bring us the baby. He said, you know, the first thing I did, he said, I was counting fingers and toes. You know what? God gave you more than you asked for. 
There's a guy I know a, a number of years ago, and he uh, he lived through the, the the hippie age of the '60s and '70s and the biker gangs and all that. And I mean, all that stuff still exists, but it was it was a big thing then. And um, he said he got saved, and he started going around to all his old party buddies because he wanted to tell them about the Lord. He wanted to tell them about the change. He said, you know, when I got saved, he said, you know, I had a big greasy ponytail. He said, I was coming to church and the preacher was preaching my hide off. And uh, he said, one day, he said, I felt like the preacher. He said, I was on the second or third row with my family. And he said, I was the black sheep. And he said, I felt like the preacher was zoning right in on me. He said, I think he was. And he said, uh, he said, but God rang my bell that day. And he said, I got saved. And he said, when I got saved, he said, I was transformed. And he said, that work that only God can do began. But he said, you know what God did? He, he did what he does for so many. He said, he put a burden on my heart to go tell all my friends that were in the same hell hole that I got saved out of. And he said, I started going to see him. He said, I'll never forget going to see one of them. He said, I knocked on his door and, and he hollered for me to come in. And he said, there was my old buddy. And he said, you know, we were in our 30s. He said, there was my buddy. And he said he was covered with strange sores and he was obviously dying. And he said, it was that party life, man. He said, we did needles. We did it all. And he said he was dying. And he said, I tried to witness to my buddy and my buddy really, you know, he, he didn't really feel like there was much hope for him. And um, he told me weeping, the, the, one, the guy that had sores and was dying, he said he was weeping. He told me, he said, Jim, he said, you made the right choice. He said, you did good. He said, I'm happy for you. And Jim said, I left that room that day. And he said, my heart was sad because he said, I felt like this is the last time I'll see. He said, but, you know, time lapsed. A few years went by and lo and behold, one day I came across my buddy again. And now he was healthy. And now he was saved. And he said, my buddy told me a story. He said, not long after I'd been there, he called on the name of the Lord. And he said, Jesus saved me. And he said, you know what the Lord did? He said, he gave me eternal life and he gave me more. He gave me his health back. Man, hadn't the Lord given you more than you asked for? I don't know where you're at today. And, and the Bible's true. No matter, no matter, you know, you, you, you might, you might be struggling with what I'm saying, but I'm just telling you. It's very clear about our Lord. This is who he is. If you'll come to him and mean business, he'll answer your prayer and he'll give you more than you ask for. Because he just wants you to know he's got it all and he can do it. And he's able and he loves you and he's the giver. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He that freely gave his own son, how shall not he not love? How shall he not much more with him give us all things? He'll give you more than you ask for. Rosalind Goforth was a missionary in China. And um, she, uh, she wrote a book called How I Know God Answers Prayer. And she said, we were over there in China for years. And, and she said, um, we were, we were coming home for a furlough, my husband and I. And she said, uh, before we left, she said, I knew when we got there, we weren't able to travel together. And, of course, they were traveling by ship. She said that, uh, you know, he had to linger behind and do some things. So I was going to come back. They were from Canada. She said, I'm going to come back to Canada. She said, I knew I'd be without my husband for a while. And she said, on top of that, he, he would be doing a lot of traveling. And she said, I had six children. To, you know, ours, she said. And uh, she said, my husband looked at me and they had already, they had lost two or three children on the mission field and, and several of their children had, had survived very terrible life-threatening injury uh, diseases. You know, we're talking about the early 1900s here. And, um, and she said, our children's health and their life was always a very, uh, it was always hanging in front of us because we'd already lost three. She said, my husband looked at me before I left for Canada and he said, sweetheart, give the children all the apples they want. Do not limit the children's apples. She said, the problem with that was, she said, I got back to Canada and she found out that was not very easy to do. 
She said apples at that point in time were very expensive. And she said, I had six kids and they were growing kids and their appetites were off the chart. She said, however, I did the best I could. And she said, I bought a few small baskets. She said, we were always praying and asking God for everything because she said, we, we didn't have a set income. We didn't have a stable income. And she said, literally, literally, we lived out of the hand of God. So guess what she asked for? She'd ask for apples. She said, I bought a few baskets. And she said, after that, she said, for some reason, I didn't have to buy anymore. She said, apples started coming. First in baskets and then in barrels. She said, they started coming from sources, friends, far distance away that were paying express postage. And she said, we hadn't asked. We didn't send out a letter. She said they were shipping apples to our door. She said on one occasion, this particular barrel came and the apples were super green and super hard. And they were such a problem to eat that the kids were complaining. And she said um, they begged her to go to the store and buy this certain type of apple, which was very expensive, but it was very sweet. And she said, I went to the store because I love my kids. And she said, I bought this tiny little basket. And she said, I had bought that tiny little basket. And the next thing I knew, a barrel came with those same apples from a distant friend. Hey, can I tell you, he'll give you more than you ask for. Did you know there's a reason to be on praying ground? Did you know that prayer is a joy and God intended it to be? He's the great giver. Amen. Ask and you shall receive. Darlene Rose, that great missionary in uh, New Guinea. For four years during the war, was a prisoner of war in New Guinea. And she said at one point, she said, I was in a cell. She said, I was on the death row, the, the corridor that was that was death row. She said, uh, anybody that, that was on that, that corridor, she said, and especially if you were at the end of the hall, she said, I was in the last cell. She said, that meant you were marked for death. And... Um, she said, I had dysentery, and she said, I was dying. She said, unless God intervened. She was very thin to begin with. Even after the war, when she was free, it took her months and months to get her health back. And she said, there I was. She said, it was stifling in those cells. And I don't know if you know anything about dysentery, and I'm not trying to be crude, but she said, you know, they don't let you go to the bathroom in a prison cell. She said, she said you know, when you got dysentery, you're, you got diarrhea out the wazoo nonstop. And, and you died from dehydration. She said, I was in serious trouble. She said, I, it was stifling hot in that tropical region. And she said, there was this little tiny window above the door, well, above, above the one wall. And she said, you could, you could, if you could get up to it, you could see a little crack of light and get a little fresh air. And she said, I managed to get my foot on a, a little thing on the wall and I was able to hoist myself up for just a moment. She said, when I looked out the window, she said, what I saw, she said, I saw people walk in the courtyard that the, the less serious prisoners were allowed to walk in the courtyard and get exercise. And she said, I saw this one dude and he would mosey over to the fence. And she said, there was a lot of vines over the fence. And she said, I saw somebody hand him some bananas through the fence. She said, I was so hungry. She said, they give us this little bowl of rice every day. And she said, that was it. One little tiny bowl. And she said, you know, when you're first in the prison cell, she said, you pull out the rocks and the worms. But she said, when you're starting to death, she said, you don't pull out the worms anymore. And she said, I fell on my knees. And she said, oh, dear God. She's there because she's a missionary. She hadn't committed a crime. She said, oh, dear God, could you just get me one banana? Lord, just one. That's all I ask. She said, all of a sudden, she heard footsteps coming down the hall. And she said, that was usually a bad sign. She said, her door bust open, and the Japanese camp commander 
stood there and she said that was good she said she said actually that her she, she had found great favor with the japanese camp commander but she said in my excitement to the japanese camp commander she said after four years in the prison camp i've learned japanese she said i jumped up and clapped and she said i said in japanese she said mr hamaji it's just like seeing an old friend and she said mr hamaji stood there in silence and tears came down his eyes and he went out and shut the door and she heard him say something to the guard. She said, then she realized she had made a terrible mistake. She said, any time those officials came to the door, you had to bow or you would be severely beaten. She said, in my excitement, I had forgotten to bow. And she said, oh, Lord. She said, Lord, couldn't you have reminded me to bow? And then she heard footsteps again. She thought, here it comes. She said, they're going to beat me half to death. And the door swung open. And they started laying them on the floor. She said, I counted them. 99 bananas. And she said, oh, Lord. I didn't believe you could give me one. I hope you leave today and hope this will ring in your soul. I hope it will make you look up towards your father with delight. I hope it will make you want to make the Lord your father. He has a goal for you. He wants you to ask. And he wants to give you more than you ask. You want to be saved today? That's a good place to start. And I got good news for you. All that stuff you're afraid of. Why don't you just chuck that out the window tell the devil go back to hell where he came from and just realize God is going to save your soul and he'll give you more than you ask for. Let's pray. Lord, help your people now. Lord, our delight to you, our, our approach to you, you intended to be a delight. But Lord, somehow, somehow for we've got that all backwards. And, and Lord, we see you as the great stingy being. And, and Lord, we, we forget that though to us belongs confusion of faith, to thee belong mercies and forgivenesses. And God, every person that's ever approached you sincerely and made their confession and pray for their friends. God, how you have rewarded them. Lord, they asked for a basket and you gave them a barrel. God, they asked for eternal life and you gave them much more. Now, Lord, help us this morning. And Lord, draw people to yourself, we pray. Lord, I pray the people in this room, I pray they call out to you. In Jesus' name. With your heads bowed, the piano's going to play. If God spoke to you this morning, whatever he said to you, why don't you talk to him this morning? Hey, why don't you? You got something you want to ask him? You mean business? He's going to answer you.
What a God. He wants to give you more than you ask for. Lord, thank you for how wonderful, Lord, that you are Mm -hmm. and how good you have been. Mm -hmm. Oh, Lord God, let us live in the shadow, Lord, or in the brightness of your goodness, Lord. Help us, Lord, in this dark world, Lord, to rejoice in your goodness, Lord. And God, help us. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Here it is. (laughs) Amen.